So I think we'll, we'll kick off in a, a minute or so. I'm not going to say very much at the start, other than to say I'm really pleased that we've got a, an exciting lineup of speakers to talk on this topic of um, assessing proof. Um, so we've got Pablo and then we'll have a break and then Chris and Siri will be looking at it from a more kind of practical hands-on aspect. So Pablo, I think, is going to give us a taster of the, the research that's been done around um, students learning a proof. Um, I just wanted to flag at this point that we're going to use the question and answer forum on the course site rather than the, the Zoom chat. So if you do have questions, I can't guarantee that we'll catch everything that happens in the Zoom chat, but what I will be keeping an eye on is this question and answer forum. Um, so if you post a new discussion topic in here, you can ask your question. Um, where do ask a question? If you want to, you can expand on it in here, but you don't have to. Um, and that way, we've got a record of all the questions there. Uh, I think you can then, other participants can do upvotes and so on, so we can maybe see if there are questions that we really, really want answered. Um, but the nice thing about it is it's there afterwards as well. So if we don't get through all the questions live in the session, um, we've got space to go and have a discussion offline. Okay, so I think I will not waste any more time and I'll hand over to our, our first speaker. Um, so Pablo, are you ready to go? I'm ready. Um, okay, let's see if I am. Um, share my screen. Okay, and oh, this is not right. Are you guys seeing the presenter view or the one single slide? I can see your slides. Just, okay, yeah, let me just, one second. I think this is sharing the wrong screen. Uh -huh. Sorry about that. We just tested it one second ago, of course. <laughs> and it looked okay. It wasn't the, the presenter notes that I was seeing. Oh, it was just one screen? It yeah, was one, just one the, slide? the slide, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry about that. Just one slide. Yeah, that's looking fine. Okay, let's do this then. All right, so uh, uh, thank you, um, uh, the, you know, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to, to talk a little bit about my research. Um, always uh, fun to do that. Um, it's Labor Day here in the US, so my wife reminded me that I'm working on a holiday, but um, I didn't realize that when I accepted the invitation. I probably would have accepted anyway, but there it is. Um, okay, so let's just jump into it. I, um, this is um, the title in, in, in George's um, uh, um, program that you just saw. Uh, it was an overview of research on teaching and learning and proof. Now, so that's what you were promised, I guess, if you had read the, 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 <laughs> the program beforehand. Uh, this is not what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to do it for a couple of reasons. Um, one, um, the research on teaching and learning of proof is, is huge. Um, and, and so I only have 30 minutes. So, you know, I, I had to select kind of the part of, of, of that uh, research that was most relevant to today's uh, workshop. And so, but, but if you are curious uh, more generally about uh, the research on, uh, on the teaching and learning of proof, I highly recommend this, this chapter um, on the recently published Compendium for Research in Mathematics Education. This was published by the uh, NCTM, um, a teachers Association of Mathematics Teachers in the U.S. Um, and, you know, this was um, um, published by, written by a couple of my uh, colleagues in math ed and, and, and yeah, highly recommend it if you're, if you're interested in a more, you know, a broader overview. So the first thing that I'm going to do is then just kind of go into the, the definition of what it is I am going to talk about. And so I need to make a distinction between two different types of activities that, um, that, that we you know, can think of when, when, when we're thinking about students engaging in, in, in proof related uh, tasks, right? So one of them is, is what I call proof construction. And so this is just, um, we have students uh, being asked to construct a proof themselves, right? And, and this can come in a variety of, 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 of you know, flavors, depending on, on what the entry point and the exit point for the student is. So for instance, they can be asked to, um, 
uh, explore a given problem. So in this case, uh, for instance, they can be uh, asked to, you know, what can you say about the number of positive integers dividing a, a, a different integers n, right? Um, and so they're not giving a statement or a conjecture or anything. They're just giving a problem situation and they have to kind of go create a conjecture and then ultimately go and prove it uh, according to this particular task. Or we can have an estimation of truth of a conjecture where you have, you know, you're given a conjecture, a statement, they, the student doesn't know if it's true or false, and they have to go and, you know, find out the truth value and, and justify it. In this particular case, provide actually a, a proof uh, of the statement or, or its negation. And uh, obviously the, the very common, you know, prove that statement where you're actually given a statement that the student can assume is correct, you know, valid uh, in the theory, and they just kind of have to go and produce a proof of it. And so, and so these, these are uh, different types of, of this, of this uh, kind of family of, of tasks, of proof construction tasks. And students are, are pretty bad overall on these type of tasks, right? Their performance is, 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 is relatively poor on this. And, and so I'll give you an example of one of, from one of my studies. So uh, we gave these seven, you know, calculus prove that tasks to uh, 73 advanced mathematics undergraduate students in the, here in the U.S. They had, you know, taken the intro to proof course, uh, real analysis, you know, first course in real analysis and, and, and proof based course in linear algebra and their performance on, on, on these seven tasks. And, and this was kind of a byproduct of a larger grant. We were looking at, 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 you know, um, at differences in, in styles in reasoning styles in, in proof construction tasks was, was pretty bad. And so these are percentages of students who got either a three or a four uh, on a five point scale going from zero to four. So, so this includes threes, which are, you know, proofs that, that, that were not fully correct, but had minor, you know, uh, problems. And, and what you can see is that, um, well, it's, it's pretty bad, especially for, for students who, as I said, had, had you know, s several courses experience in, in proof based mathematics. And so this is just an example. This is by now, no means the only evidence that we have that's, that students struggle with proof construction. Um, so for example, Cohen Nuth in 2009 found that none of the 36 mathematics majors in their study could successfully complete any one of three assigned proven tasks. So again, this is kind of generalized that, that this is the situation is pretty bad. And the reasons for why um, are, you know, we have very, uh, a variety of reasons why students struggle with proof construction, uh, going from very general, you know, students' ways of uh, ascertaining and persuading themselves about the truth of a mathematical statement is different from that of mathematicians, problems with language and conceptual understanding of the, of the concepts in those proofs. Um, uh, and then there are some more specific ones, some more specific to, to proof construction itself. So there's a lack of stra strategic knowledge. Uh, uh, you know, they have to make certain decisions when they're, when they're uh, trying to construct a proof and, and you know, and, and some, of, some of our students are not so good with that. And then there's the issue of, of kind of going back and forth between different representation systems and maybe being able to translate an informal argument that they have into, into a formal proof. Uh, and so, so these are, uh, uh, as I said, a myriad of, of reasons why in, in research we have seen that students uh, may be having trouble constructing proofs. And there's certainly many researchers trying to um, uh, look into ways of helping students with, with um, some of these different difficulties. Um, and there's other researchers who are looking into, you know, looking elsewhere. And so that's what I want to look at here. Um, so the second family of, of, of activities is what I call proof read, you know, reading activities. So in this case, you're not asked to, to construct a proof. Uh, you're, you're asked to read one um, and, and, and to read one for, you know, to either to comprehend it or to evaluate it. Now, it should come to no, you know, as no surprise to, to this audience that, that we do this all the time, right? So our university uh, mathematics students spend a substantial amount of time seeing proofs presented to them in class, reading proofs in books and lecture notes. Um, and then in terms of evaluation, I don't know if you've seen these kind of tasks, they're not as common, but certainly uh, I, I use them in my courses. Uh, there's these kind of uh, tasks where we give a student a purported proof uh, and we ask the student to, to grade it. Uh, in this particular case, give one of three grades, either correct, partially correct or failure. Um, and we can imagine other you know, evaluation activities in a classroom where students are, ask, are being asked, for instance, to to uh, peer assess um, uh, each other's uh, proof uh, attempts, right? Um, so if we're asking students to 
look at somebody else's proof attempt and kind of evaluate it. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's that particular activity going on. And what we've seen in the research is that there's, there was, until very, until recently, there was not much uh, research in that, in that, in that area, in that second uh, kind of family of, of, um, of, of activities. And then one, one thing uh, that may be going on is that maybe students um, have no problems reading mathematics. Maybe that's not where they have problems with. Maybe they have problems with constructing, but that's not the case. And we know that that's not the case. Mm. Um, we have a, 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 a feeling, a gut feeling that that's not the case. And this can be represented by, this is Carl Cohen, um, mathematician writing uh, at the American Mathematical Monthly in 1991, in a, um, you know, uh, 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 one of several arguments that have been made by, by mathematicians saying, look, we need to be taking, um, uh, you know, paying attention to reading, the reading of mathematics. And so Carl Cohen says, look, if you need evidence that we have a problem, let one of your B students explain the statement of a theorem from a homework exercise that they have not been able to prove or have them explain the statement and proof of a theorem from a section in the book that you have skipped. My students, at least, they do not have the innate ability to read and understand what they have read. When I asked them to read a problem and explain it to me, the majority simply recited the same words back again. And so, look, one of the things is that if we are really concerned about proof construction, then maybe the fact that students are unable to understand the proof that they read could be part of the problem, right? I mean, it would be weird. It seems natural for our students to struggle to write their own proofs if, if they don't understand the genre, in a sense. Um, and then there's other arguments to be made to, um, uh, as well, to be looking at, at, at proof reading. Um, Carl Cohen con, um, uh, continued in that same article, uh, posing that it's actually a more useful uh, competence. So he says, he said, very few of our students will ever, after leaving our courses, have to give a formal proof of a theorem, and few will have to do something so mundane as find the definite integral. On the other hand, many of them will have to read um, and understand mathematical writing to apply new ideas to the problems of their job. So again, this idea of consumption of mathematics being, being very, very important, maybe more important than the, than the production of new mathematical knowledge, and you know, then we should probably pay attention to it in, in our, in our uh, classes. So, okay, so there you go. So that's kind of the, 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 the framing then, what I'm going to be talking about then is, is about these three big questions about proof reading, uh, what does it mean to comprehend the proof? How can we assess proof comprehension and how can we improve students' comprehension of the proofs that they read? So uh, I've gone from the general issue, uh, re general area of research on proof uh, in mathematics education to this uh, more focused, it's still big questions, but more focused on proof comprehension. And so regarding the first one, what does it mean to comprehend the proof? Um, look, this is um, a, a question that we asked ourselves uh, a few years ago and you, know, you have a proof in front of you uh, one of those proofs that we typically give our students and we ask, you know, okay, you know, what does it mean to understand this? You know, how, you know, what, what would it look like for a student to read this and, and understand it? And one of the things that we did to start to answer this question was, you know, go and, and interview mathematicians about, you know, some of the different ways uh, um, or some of the different answers that they could give to this, to this question. And, and one very, very um, useful distinction that we found in our data uh, this is one mathematician that illustrates this idea, was this distinction between two different levels of understanding this mathematician says. One level of understanding is knowing the logic, knowing why the proof is true. A different level of understanding is seeing the big idea in the proof. Uh, when I read a proof, I sometimes think, how is the author really trying to go about this? What specific things is he trying to do and how does he go about doing them? Understanding that, I think, is different than understanding how each sort of logical piece fits together. And so we had this distinction that it was made not only by these mathematicians, this is just one example, but general, um, uh, generally from our um, uh, group of mathematicians that we interviewed, we had this distinction of, of you know, kind of two ways of mentally representing a proof, uh, right? As, as a sequence of, of, of steps that are chained and you need to understand how each one follows from the previous one. But then a, a different one that is kind of more general, more holistic, kind of based on, on, on main ideas of the proof. So in this particular case, the idea that we can construct a number, for instance, in this case, obviously we're proving that the set of prime numbers is infinite. That we can construct this number n so that, you know, from our list of primes, there's gotta be one that divides that number n, but at the same time, none of them can divide uh, that number n. And, and so, you know, understanding that, that, that proof in terms of those, of those bigger ideas. And so 
Okay, so again, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna leave it uh, there for now in terms of that distinction, but this will come useful to us when we think about um, um, the second question of how can we assess proof comprehension. Now, when we were looking at this particular question, one of the things that we wanted to do was, okay, let's, let's go in and ask mathematicians what they are doing. So how are we assessing proof comprehension? And so this was something that was done uh, not by me, but my colleague, Keith Weber, um, uh, in, a, in an interview study again. And when he asked uh, about, um, you know, what kind of tools do we have to assess students' proof comprehension of a given proof, he found generally that mathematicians can, kind of had one of three answers. And, 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 you know, and maybe you can see yourself represented in one of these three. So, so we either ask the students to reproduce the proof that they read. And so if you're giving a proof that's, you know, um, square root of two is irrational, then you ask, you know, in a, in a quiz or an exam, you know, prove that a square root of two is irrational. Um, or maybe you ask students to prove um, uh, a similar proof, right? So a classical example is when you show them, you know, present in class that the square root of two is irrational, maybe you ask them to prove that the square root of five is irrational, right? Something like that. Or, and this was something that came up um, uh, in, in our, in, in Keith's uh, uh, interviewees, uh, they would just say, well, look, actually we, we don't assess this. And, 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 and some of them were actually not happy about the situation. Uh, they, they thought uh, proof comprehension was important and, and they didn't really, you know, they were not really doing it. And so what we uh, ended up doing was coming up with, um, and this was based on um, looking at the literature in, in math education and the philosophy of mathematics on the kinds of things that are um, um, valued or types of understandings that are valued in, in, in proof comprehension uh, from these interviews uh, with mathematicians. And what we came up with was um, a model um, um, that, that would help a, an instructor or a researcher in math to generate questions um, that, that could help them assess the extent to which a student had understood or comprehended the proof that they just read. And so what you can see here is that there are two types, two families of, of items or, or types of questions. Um, the first one is related to that, you know, line by line reading that I, I referred to uh, back then, you know, we call them local uh, type of understandings. And the second uh, are, are, are what we call holistic types of understanding or, or types of questions to assess proof comprehension. Um, I don't have time to go through the whole model and it would be a little bit boring, but I, I will uh, illustrate uh, these, these uh, uh, different types of items with, with two of them, one, one from the local family, and one from the uh, holistic one. So if you look, for instance, at this proof, right? So this is the proof that the set of prime numbers is infinite and kind of this is the, you know, this is the way that it appears in, in the textbook that I use in my introduction to proof course. Um, one of the things that you see in, the, in, in proofs, obviously, is, is, is this bunch of um, a sequence of statements that are made and not every single one has a, an explicit justification. And one of the things that you could uh, ask a student, a reader, is to justify some of those claims. So for instance, in this proof, we have uh, claims like n is a natural number greater than one, or n, uh, n has to have a prime, has a prime divisor q, and q has to be greater than one. There's all of these statements that are not explicitly justified. And so you could imagine that one of the things that you could do to assess the proof, you know, a reader's comprehension of this particular proof is to, is to ask them to, to, to justify those claims. So you could ask, why is it valid to conclude that n is a natural number there? Or why does n have to have a prime divisor? Why exactly can one conclude that if Q is prime, then it has to be greater than one and so on and so forth. So that's one type of question uh, from the local, you know, assessing kind of the local understanding of the proof, the, the, the chain kind of a representation of the proof in the student's minds, um, of the reader's minds. I'll give you an example of the other one, uh, of the other family, which is kind of the more general one. So in this particular case, we, we, we were talking about this idea of understanding the proof as a, as a uh, uh, in terms of kind of the general methods. And so we, in this particular proof, again, you see this construction of this N is kind of the main idea of this proof and kind of um, 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 you could wonder whether the, the, or the extent to which a reader would be able to, to carry out a similar construction or to use that method or that general idea in another setting. And so you could ask, um, uh, you know, uh, different types of, of, of questions that could require um, uh, giving you a specific step uh, regarding that, the use of that general method in another setting. So for instance, in this particular case, we're asking um, what would be the value of n that one could use to prove that there are an infinite number of primes that are you know, uh, three mod four. 
Uh, so that could be, you know, you, they don't have to construct the, the construct the whole proof, just, you know, give you the, the construction of the end. Or you could ask them to, you know, to, to use that, that same idea in, a, in another setting and, and actually construct the proof. Um, so that's another example of, of uh, that's one example of the of, of types of items that we kind of uh, um, suggested we could generate um, to to assess the holistic understanding of proofs. Okay, so what have we done with this? So, uh, and this leads us to the third question, right? So how can we improve proof comprehension? Now, one of the things that we have in the literature or that we had at, 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 up to that point when we were working on, on, on this uh, proof assessment um, uh, model was that there were suggestions, the suggestions for how to help students uh, understand the proofs that they read. But since there, were not, there wasn't a, a, a kind of a, um, uh, an understanding a com of, of what you know what what would be the, the the standard here what would it you know how would we assess you know whether or not these things are working then then this wasn't done then the assessment itself uh, of, of the techniques but that that didn't mean that didn't stop mathematicians and math educators for from uh, putting forward uh, different ideas to help students um, um, uh, understand the proofs that they read mm. And so here I have three of those. So one of them is Uri Leron's idea of presenting proofs in a structured way. So he said that the linear method, the traditional linear method uh, of presenting proofs kind of, you know, it made it very difficult for the reader to understand what was the main idea and so on and so forth. And so he proposed to present proofs in a structural way. Um, and he used this, this diagram that you're seeing here where the idea was that he would give, instead of just kind of giving the A sub one, A sub two, you know, the linear, presenting, presenting the proof in a linear way, he would present a, a, met, a general summary of the proof and say, look, this is what we're gonna do. Uh, no details, you know, this is kind of the, we're gonna make these three big steps, right? And that's up front for the reader to understand what the general strategy was. And if you're interested in the, if the reader was interested in the details, then they would have to go into a lower, he called them levels so he could go to level two where again it would be a summary of of, of the of that you know kind of step in that myth in, the, in the, at that level and then if they wanted further details then the reader could go to level three below and kind of uh, see how that that was developed and similarly we had others right so uh, mason and, and pym suggested in the 80s this idea of, of using generic proofs uh, the idea was to uh, instead of presenting proofs in terms of a uh, of, of abstract uh, uh, objects, uh, like in this case, I guess, you know, uh, even integers, to present it in terms of, of, of examples, um, examples that were generic in the sense that they could, you know, the proof could work for any other example. So in this particular case, they were illustrating the fact that you could prove that the sum of even integers is an integer with this picture that it's obviously not a proof in the sense that it's, it's, it's a specific, but you could see it generically, right? A reader could see that they could do the same thing that they did with these specific three numbers, they could do with any even numbers, right? So they could see that, that the sum of, 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 of two even numbers is, is an even number based on, on, the, on the general reasoning that, that was behind uh, kind of this, this, this one um, generic example. And so he, they called that generic proofs. And again, kind of the suggestion was that this would help students kind of understand the proofs that they read. And then Lara Alcock uh, 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 recently um, uh, came up with this idea of using new proofs uh, where, you know, these are multimedia using, you know, um, full force of the computer to um, show students uh, a proof and, and comment on it. And so Lara's uh, had a voice over that would kind of go in detail into the, the steps and, and how the different steps were related. Uh, like in that, you know, I have a screenshot there of a uh, proof of Cauchy's uh, mean value theorem. And, and, and you can see how, how it's, it's kind of, drawing the attention to the reader to the connection of these two steps in the proof. And again, but at, at this point there was no, you know, we didn't have a way of, of seeing to what extent they, they were successful, right? And so one of the things that, that we started doing when, when, when we came up with the model and, and ways of generating these, these proof comprehension tests was, well, let's go in and, and see if they work. And I'll just tell you a little bit about part of the story for, for the structure of proofs. Um, so we went in and, 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 and tried to assess the extent to which students, uh, structure proofs did, did help uh, students understand proof better. And, and look, to be fair to Uri, uh, he, he said in his paper, he said, look, I don't know of any way to prove or disprove my claims on the merits of the structural method, right? So he's very upfront about, about you know, what I'm suggesting just feels like it, it could work, but I have no idea how to do it, right? How, how we would go about, about, about doing that. And 
And the second thing that I'll say here is that the do they work seems to be like a natural question to ask when you're you know, proposing a, a, a pedagogical uh, um, suggestion. But at the same time, no single study will be able to answer that general question, right? So, I mean, just bear, have this in mind as, as we go along uh, this, this study. And so what we did was um, we had two studies. We had a qualitative study, uh, um, uh, an interview study, think aloud protocol. So students are kind of uh, um, um, telling us what they're thinking about as they're reading these proofs in these, in these different formats. Um, and then what we wanted to do is gain insight into how this type of proof presentation might help or hinder students' comprehension of a proof. And we also had a quantitative study where we created a proof comprehension uh, test based on our model. and um, and had students distributed uh, 200 participants uh, participating in this, in this quantitative study. They were randomly assigned to either students reading structure proofs of a given theorem or, or a linear one. And so what we found was that with respect to the qualitative study, we found that the features of the format were not actually widely appreciated. Uh, roughly half of the participant is either disliked or were confused by them uh, in the structure proofs. And the biggest one, the, the, the biggest complaint that students had about, about this, this, this format of presenting proofs was that the, the multi-level way um, 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 of, of presenting the proofs uh, forced the students to kind of go back and forth between different parts of the proof, right? So they were reading level one and the big summary was saying, look, in level three, we do this. And then the student would say, well, I guess I have to go and look at level three at this point. And they would go and read level three and then, and then you go back to level two and then, okay, where was I in level one? And so that created, you know, it was, it was, it was a difficult thing for them to do. Um, and so, and so that, was, that was one of the biggest complaints. And then when we went to the quantitative uh, study, we actually did not find any significant comprehension gains of, of the structure proofs. Uh, there was um, one particular type of item where, where uh, structure, uh, students who had read the structure proofs were doing better, and that was kind of uh, the one, as we would expect, the summary question with the general, what was the general idea of the, of the proof, and obviously students were reading kind of the, the summary at the start, and they kind of had that. But in the other ones, it was actually worse. Um, again, there was, there was no significant difference. I mean, essentially, we considered them to be the same. But if we were reading the tea leaves as, as we were looking at our, our, our numbers, uh, we could actually see that they were doing well in, in, in some, but, but actually worse in the others. So, OK, so an old result, uh, really. Uh, we didn't have any, any, any significant comprehension gains. And this was something that we started noticing in the other ones as well with respect to the other uh, proposed ways of, of presenting proof. So uh, the same happened with generic proofs. Um, uh, we recently published a paper on, 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 a, on a test of that particular um, um, pedagogical uh, suggestion. And then Lara herself um, uh, found, again, no, no difference. Uh, it was students who were reading her e-proofs were not doing any better on the, on the proof comprehension uh, test that they were designing using our, our model. And so here again, I just want to say, of course, it doesn't mean that, this, that these pedagogical suggestions don't work. I mean, we had very specific ways of implementing them in our studies. But what that does mean is that we should not just assume that they do, right, that they work. Uh, and, and maybe part of the, 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 the task there for, for as, as we think about ways of, of uh, as we think of suggestions of, of how to improve uh, proof comprehension of our students is that we need to kind of think about the details of, of the implementation, right? Exactly how exactly do we imagine and that, 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 that intervention being implemented in, in classrooms. Um, now, not to, you know, I don't wanna, um, you know, give you, leave, have you leave here thinking that nothing has worked. Um, these ha have all been instructor dependent interventions. So the, the, the instructor is doing something, you know, presenting the proof in a particular way, but we also have reader dependent interventions. So we teach the students to do something uh, and 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 uh, which is different from us, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, changing the way that we present the proofs. And in that particular uh, uh, area, we have found some significant differences, ways of improving uh, students' proof comprehension. So, self-explanation is a technique uh, for reading in general that has been shown in educational psychology literature to be very effective. Uh, it is very simple. It involves the reader stopping at different points uh, uh, of the text that they're reading and to self-explain to themselves what, what's been going on in that text. So you stop and you say, uh, I see what they're saying is that this is the, uh, 
uh, I see that's the case because, you know. And so um, the self-explanation literature started with um, um, researchers just noticing that good readers did this naturally, uh, that they would self-explain uh, uh, more than, than those that, that didn't comprehend the text as, as well. And so they, they, they wonder whether this could be taught, you know, can you teach students to self-explain? And, and the answer was yes. And, and it was, you know, again, very robust results in, in, result in educational psychology. And so what um, Mark Hudson and, and his colleagues uh, uh, wanted to do was to see if, 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 if something similar could be, could be found in, in mathematics, right? And specifically in the case of, of proofs, uh, when reading proofs. And so they conducted uh, three studies uh, to test the uh, effectiveness of, of uh, self-explanation training in, in math undergrads. And they actually did find that, that this improved uh, proof comprehension. Um, one of the things that uh, the last study, I think, is one of the most compelling ones. Um, uh, they, they do it in, uh, this is done in, in a classroom setting, so it's not a laboratory setting. So they do it in a classroom setting and, and, and participants, students are kind of randomly assigned to, you know, either reading, uh, being trained on self-explanation so, so self or, or doing something else, and then they were giving these proofs. And one of the interesting things about these ones is that they did a delayed post-test. So 20 days after, um, so they, they test the students right after being trained, and indeed they, there is gains in proof comprehension uh, for the uh, self-explanation group, and that's the dark gray there. Um, uh, but then they do a delayed one as well. And so 20 days later, they come back and, 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 and show them a different proof and you know, they do a proof comprehension test and, and indeed they, the, the students are still. So, to, so that, those gains are retained um, 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 20 days later. And so, so this is one of those examples where we have you know, a positive answer of, of you know, uh, we have a way that we can, that we can help students improve uh, proof comprehension. Now, up to this point, uh, we were using our model to generate these tests um, um, uh, to, you know, research issues around proof comprehension that hadn't been done up to that point. So I was really uh, gratifying. Um, but at that point, and this is, I'm going to take a step, half a step back at this point. I want to, I want to tell you a little bit of, a, of, the, of the story of where this led us, this led us and why. Um, the significance of, of the results of, of these kind of studies heavily depend on the validity of the test used, right? So if you don't believe the tests that are being used on, on, the, on the, you know, the studies for structural proofs, generic proofs, then you don't, you know, the, 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 the results don't mean much. Um, and so what we wanted to do was, up to this point, researchers were really just kind of taking our model, generating their own questions, and then, you know, using them in, the, in, the, in their studies. And, and we wonder, you know, can we, you know, it could be, and a skeptic would say, you know, can you really measure something as complex as proof comprehension with short multiple choice tests, right? And to a great extent, we, you know, the, the tests being used up to that point were multiple choice. And, uh, and then the follow up question is, are these, you know, ad hoc proof comprehension tests any good? And so what we wanted to do was um, kind of get into the area of psychometrics and try to make, try to see if we could actually generate uh, tests, proof comprehension tests that had you know, the, the, the standard, uh, you know, met the standards of, of a good test in, in, in psychometrics. And, and in particular, I mean, there are different things that you can look at, but, but we were looking at seeing if, if we can produce tests that were reliable and, and valid, right? Um, you know, I, I, to what extent would we expect to obtain similar results uh, with the same tests under, you know, consistent conditions? And in terms of validity, to what extent are students getting the right wrong answer for the right reason, right? So for instance, are they just not using multiple choice, uh, choice uh, test taking techniques, things like that. And so what we did there was um, we, um, this was a proof of concept. We, uh, our first grant was, look, we're gonna try to create proof comprehension tests for these three theorems that are used in, you know, in the US in an intro to proof course. Um, that the set of prime numbers is infinite, which is the one that you saw, uh, proof comprehension test for the proof that every third Fibonacci number is even. In this case, we're interested in doing one for, you know, induction proofs. And then a little mid-year result that the open interval uh, from zero to one is uncountable. And so our idea was that we wanted to create um, um, proof comprehension tests that could be used by, you know, any professors in, in, you know, in a transition to proof course and that they could also be used by math education researchers in their, in their, in their research, like you know, the research that we had seen until then, but then you know, not have the, the, the kind of the dark cloud over them in terms of the validity of the tests. And look, the, the distance between creating your own test based on the, on the in a not hoc manner, you know, in, in, um, 
uh, based just using our assessment model uh, to doing it in you know to obtain kind of uh, these more you know higher quality measures is 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 a large one right and so I'm not going to go over this but but this is a multi-step uh, process that um, starts with the generation of open-ended items for each one of the different uh, types of assessment um, questions that we have in our model. Then we go and interview students to try to get their, their own answers to those uh, questions, open-ended questions. We use their own answers to generate multiple choice items. Then we go and interview more students to try to see that students, you know, that they're actually interpreting the multiple choice items in the, in the way that, that that we intended and that there are no you know weird kind of ways in which they're getting the answer right or wrong for the wrong reasons right um, then we distribute those tests to a large number of students and particularly one of the main goals of doing that is to reduce the number of items the original tests the open-ended were 20 uh, questions it took around 40 minutes to distribute them in the co in, in a course and that makes them well that makes them usable in research not really in you know in in in, in classrooms i mean instructors are probably going to be unlikely to use something uh, for a quiz that takes 40 minutes to distribute. So, so we wanted to get rid of answers of questions that were actually getting at the same thing that other, other questions were. And we then, you know, again, another set of interviews with, with students with the short version of the test, make sure that everything is right. And then we start replicating um, the, re the results, the kind of finding out that the psychometric properties that we found in the original study kind of held in other populations and so on and so forth. And, and we did it. We, we, it was, it was it, you know, those, those tests kind of met the standards. Uh, you know, we had uh, internal reliabilities of above 0.7 for comeback alpha. And, um, and we had certain validities, uh, validity checks in terms of correlations between the tests and, and with their uh, appropriate measures. Um, there has to be something in between doing, you know, just creating the items, looking at our assessment method, and then and then this, you know, uh, and and I think that's something that that George and and um, um, and Chris and and uh, you know ha, ha, are thinking about, and 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 that's you know worth discussing. Um, what we are currently doing is using that method to create um, uh, tests in real analysis. So um, um, we're creating proof comprehension tests, again, this, the same idea, multiple choice tests, short ones, probably around 10 items each to, to measure proof comprehension of each one of these eight theorems in, in a, you know, introduction to real analysis course. Um, and um, we, looking at the future, there's a lot of things that we are looking into. One of the things that I, again, I think, I think Chris has, has mentioned this, and I, I would love to see some of this done, you know, creating some sort of repository of proof comprehension tests that both prof, you know, instructors and, and researchers can use. Um, looking at other ways of assessing proof comprehension, um, uh, I have colleagues using what is called comparative judgment. So they ask students to summarize the proof and then use comparative judgment to judge, to, to assess, you know, to what extent that student understood the proof that they just read. There's oral assessments. And for us, uh, uh, we are very, very uh, interested in looking at, at, at you know, are there more general proof comprehension competencies, such as comprehension of a particular proof techniques, like, you know, proof by contradiction. Is there such a thing as somebody kind of understands proof by contradiction, but not all the techniques, or is it a little bit more general, right? Um, and the types of proof comprehension abilities and competencies that correlate with success in advanced mathematics courses. And we, since, since we designed those tests, we've started using them to kind of see how they correlate with other measures. And if people are, are interested, well, I can talk about that in the Q&A as well. I don't know how many minutes I have. I don't think I have many. So I'm just going to jump right at one of my last slides where uh, I want to go back to, to uh, probably what many of you are interested in, and it's these this ways of improving proof comprehension. Uh, so I've talked about uh, um, you know, instructor-dependent and reader-dependent strategies. I mentioned one, which was self-explanation in the reader-dependent. There's more. So uh, Keith Weber, my colleague, uh, closely studied uh, you know, pairs of high-achieving math students to try to identify fruitful um, uh, strategies, proof-reading strategies. And he later actually in a survey study with uh, more than 80 participants confirmed that these strategies were valued by, by the mathematicians who teach you know, proof-based courses. And one of those strategies that he found was that these students were breaking proofs into parts as they were reading them. So they were reading them and they're saying, okay, so this part is doing that and this part is doing this and so on and so forth. And so, and so uh, as a strategy, again, 
there hasn't been kind of large end tests of, of, of the, the impact of, of using this strategy or teaching you know, students to, to use this particular strategy, but it's definitely worth, worth exploring, right? And then the, the last thing that I'll say is that just like we're looking at some strategies that happen during the presentation or the reading of the proof itself, there are also strategies that, you know, that have been posed, that uh, uh, put forward, that happen before the presentation or the reading of the, of the proof itself. And, and both reader dependent and instructor dependent. So in the reader dependent, for instance, Keith, again, same study, he found that students, that those same students were thinking about how they would prove the theorem before reading the proof. So they would read the, the theorem and before starting to read the proof, they would say, let me just stop here and see how would I do that myself? And again, this was something that was uh, valued by the, you know, by the mathematicians that teach proof-based courses and, and hasn't been tested yet. So, so you know, worth, worth exploring as well. And then in terms of the instructor dependent uh, strategies that happen before uh, the presentation of the proofs, uh, we have thought about a couple of them as we have the, um, um, given our, our tests. We have um, the use of proof comprehension tests themselves may actually sensitize the students to certain types of, of, of things that they should or ought to be getting out of the proofs that they read and may actually change the way that they read them. So this comes from informal reports of, you know, students coming out of our studies and saying, I, why, you know, why never, nobody told me that, that, that this is kind of the information that I should be getting from reading a proof. And, and, and the idea that, you know, now that they know, maybe, you know, their, their proof reading uh, uh, changes, right? Um, and similarly, you know, you, we could think about actually teaching the proof comprehension model. Uh, this is something that I do with my students, but I haven't tested to what extent, you know, kind of, uh, again, begin uh, um, uh, to what extent it, it, it actually helps. Um, the last thing that I'll say is that obviously this is the, the, the stuff that I, you know, kind of described here is, you know, comes from a lot of different people, not only my own, but even the stuff that I talked about uh, uh, that comes from my group, it's a big group. And, and so in terms of the proof comprehension research, a lot of people have been involved uh, at different stages. So Keith has been uh, a, a copy eye in, in, in both grants. Jimmy was a copy eye in the first one. Drew is in the new one. Kristen was a graduate student in the first one and now it's a copy eye in the second one. Uh, Kate, a bunch of different students as well. So obviously it takes, it takes a lot of people. Um, I'll stop there, <laughs> thank you. All right, thanks very much, Pablo. Um, so I've been keeping an eye on the question and answer forum. There were a couple of questions that have come through. Um, there was one from David Searle asking, could you say a bit more about the, the model with the seven um, parts to it? And some people have helpfully added on the, the forum already links to the paper. So don't feel that you need to go into a whole lot more detail, but if you want to say a bit more about that, I think there's- Yeah, I'll give a short description of of each one of those labels. And yeah, I'm sorry about doing that. I hate just seeing a table with labels in that. Quite people's appetite. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so definitely, definitely the paper, obviously, for a, for a fuller description and examples. But I'll just give a brief uh, description of each one of these different types of items. So for the three that are local, the meaning of terms and statements is really just that. So we have a lot of statements in our proofs. For in, in this particular case, we would want to know, for instance, if a student actually knows what a prime number is, what does it mean for a set to be infinite, and so on and so forth. And so those questions are actually just asking students if they know, you know, uh, asking them about the meaning of those terms. The logical status of statements uh, in the proof um, comes about uh, the different kind of structures, uh, proof structures that we have. And so for instance, in proof by contradiction, like the one that I presented here, um, we start the proof by saying, suppose that the set of primes is finite, right? And one of the things that we would wanna know is whether the extent to which the, the student understand what's going on there. Why are we making that assumption? What's the logical status of that particular uh, statement there? And so we ask questions about, about those as well. So the same thing about the, once you get to the contradiction, kind of understand, you know, kind of checking whether the student and the reader understands, um, you know, what is the role of that contradiction in the whole, in the whole proof. Um, I've talked a little bit about the justification of claims in, claims in the proof. Uh, the holistic one, uh, high level ideas of the proof, uh, really we're looking at whether they, uh, you know, proofs had a lot, a, 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 a lot of different steps. And, and what we want to know is whether students can 
just come up a little bit and and kind of discern what are kind of the more the the, the, the more important or the the key uh, parts of the of the of the proof. And one way in which we do that is we ask them to summarize. And and as I said, there are other groups uh, in the world looking at this idea of using proof summaries um, um, as as a as a measure for proof comprehension. So you can ask the student to summarize the proof, and in the summaries themselves of, of the students, you can notice. You know, you can see what they extracted as being the most important uh, ideas of the proof and whether or not that agrees with your idea of what's, you know, what those main ideas are. Modular structure for proofs that are longer, um, you know, for especially for those that include, you know, uh, lemmas and, and corollaries and whatnot. We want to know whether students can chunk, you know, the, the information in the proof in, in, in different modules. And, and again, this was something that came up from, from the interviews, but also from the literature that um, um, mathematicians value that particular way of, of, of reading a proof. I've talked about general methods of the proof and then the last one for illustrating the proof with examples. Um, and again, I, I, this, this, may, this, this, this probably isn't surprising to, to this audience. The idea here is that we can carry out the steps of the proof in terms of not kind of in the abstract terms in which it's presented, but in terms of a specific example. So this is something that, you know, again, very often mathematicians would say, well, look, if I'm reading a proof, I just want to check that I'm really understanding what's going on. And I, so I just kind of bring up, you know, a particular example of the kind of family of, of objects that this thing is talking about. And I just carry out the proof in terms of that particular example. And that kind of gives me a, a, a particular type of understanding of that proof. Um, so yeah, so those are, are, the, are, the, are the seven kind of different types of questions uh, that we could, could, came, came up, uh, again, based on a kind of uh, systematic review of the literature and, 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 and some of the data that we had collected ourselves uh, with um, interviews with mathematicians. Great, thank you. Um, and I noticed that you were saying these tests are available. So is that the original three? And right. The ones are still a work in progress. So the original three are, are available at the at our proof um, at our research groups website, mm -hmm. um, and then the real analysis ones. I'll I'll tell you where we're at in this in this. We are right here. We are in the main study. We are the, uh, distributing the tests. So what we have is tests, multiple choice tests for each one of those eight theorems that we are not ready to distribute widely because uh, we don't know, you know how good they are yet. We need to get rid of bad items in a sense. COVID-19 obviously stopped this in, this, in, in spring 2000, you know, this, this year. And, and so we, who knows how long, how much longer we're gonna take um, um, completing that, that part. But if you're curious and you wanna see some, some items and you know, again, with the warning that we don't know <laughs> how good they are, absolutely, we can, we can definitely uh, share some of those. But we anticipate that within a year or, or probably within a year, we should be able to, to, to um, post in the same way that, that we posted the original three uh, in our website. And this is the, the website, pcrg.gsc. Okay, thanks. I'll add a link to that onto the, the course page as well. Um, okay, I think thanks very much, Pablo. Um, this would be the point where everyone was clapping. Um, <laughs> one of the, the downsides of doing things online, I guess. Um, oh, there's Chris with applause. I think we're going to hand over to Chris now. Um, and I think that kind of follows on nicely from what you were saying because Chris is talking about. Uh, a sort of practical application of the model that you were just describing. Excellent. Good. Yeah, thanks so much, Pablo, for that talk. Um, and my, my talk is going to follow on directly from that. So I think um, I'm just going to push on. And let me share my screen to get started. OK. So um, my goal has been really very practical. And in particular, um, I want to teach students to write. I want to teach students to write traditional mathematical proofs independently. I mean, that is the goal of all of this, right? That we want the students to come out of their degree being able to prove stuff. Um, and I want to do that supported by online assessment. So um, many people will know already, but I'll just say so again now. Um, one of the outcomes of my research is an online assessment system called Stack, which I'll show you in a minute. But I want to use online assessment to support students um, teaching and learning. 
And quite a few years ago, I was asked to see if we could um, automate high school exams, automate the assessment of high school exams. So you'd have a completely digital exam. Um, and with Nadine Kocha, we, we sat down and we looked at the international baccalaureate exams, which are taken by 18-year-olds uh, at the end of high school, They're absolutely typical of 18-year-old maths exams. And what we realised as part of that was that a very significant proportion of the marks in those high school exams were for marking sorry, well, for method. And method means reasoning by equivalence. Uh, method means line by line working um, of this, this type here. So reasoning by equivalence, about a third of the marks in international baccalaureate are for precisely this activity, working line by line so that the lines are equivalent. This is what method means. And this is where proof starts. This is a complete, a complete mathematical argument, um, you're, you're solving an equation working line by line. Um, and so we started off trying to allow students to enter their mathematical working into the online assessment system. Um, the, the student's answer is a complete mathematical expression and the goal is to, um, to assess that. So here's what it looks like. Um, if the students are just type stuff on the left, the system interprets it on the right. But already you'll notice the system is uh, in the blue text on the far right hand side. The system is automatically determining the natural domain of an expression and you'll see that, that natural domain changes and the student hasn't mentioned anything about natural domains and the student hasn't typed in any logical symbols and actually um, the system will try to establish whether these lines are equivalent the red question marks means that the system hasn't established that they're equivalent because we have got domain enlargements so they can't be the same expression and then at the end, the student has just dropped one of the roots because that doesn't satisfy the original equation. Well, I'm mentioning all of this because if your goal is to take a student's proof and automatically decide whether it's correct, it's just really a, a, a hugely complicated problem, right? I mean, never mind real analysis, even just simple algebraic derivations of the, of the most um, mechanical, dull kind are just, are just basically very difficult to, to, to assess. So I would say that in terms of assessment of free form proof, if a student types up a proof and you want to get the computer to decide if the proof is complete and correct, then we just, we just can't do it. So to get some inspiration from the technology angle, I started to um, interact with the automatic theorem proving community and look at their, their tools, Cock and Lean, and their approach is to become ultra formal. Um, and that doesn't really fit with traditional proving. On the other hand, professional mathematicians use LaTeX and LaTeX doesn't encode any meaning. LaTeX literally just arranges boxes on the screen and types as boxes. So I think there's this huge disconnect at the moment um, between the technologies available to, to support the automatic assessment of proof. Assessment of proof will just require a sea change in how we write mathematics. So let me give you one concrete example of that. Here is a page from Pell's algebra textbook from the 1660s. And what is Pell trying to do? So the middle column, which is numbered, contains numbered lines. The left-hand column explains what he's doing. And the third right-hand column is him doing it. So A equals question mark, B equals question mark in equations one and two. He's saying, I want to find little a and I want to find little b. So in line three, what does he do? He adds line one and two and he gets two a is d plus e. Right? So that's, that is what, um, that's what Pell's doing here. So we could certainly, we could certainly develop an, a, a kind of digital interface to this if we wanted to, and that may have its uses. Um, but whatever we do, if we're going to accept students free form proofs or even they're just their working and their methods, we're going to need to do something like this to to encode more than just the algebraic expressions that students write without any logic or without any domains. So I've actually stepped back from that and uh, I have sort of abandoned the short term attempt to assess students proof because I just don't think it's technically possible. Um, and actually, I think the more I think about this problem or what we're trying to achieve, I think under assessing the understanding of components of proof might actually better serve our students. So rather than just have them write out mostly incorrect proofs and Pablo showed us some data on, on the extent to which um, uh, students have 
can even interpret the meaning of expressions, never mind their proofs. You know, we don't do very well at the moment, and I think we would better serve students if we just focus on, on individual parts of the proof, or at least part of their learning. We'll come back to that later. So, together with Robbie Bickerton, um, I would like to just record for the record, Pablo, thank you for your work. It has been inspirational. It's been extremely useful to us. But we want to do some practical things. We want to actually develop some practical techniques for developing problem sequences and using those with our students. So the three things that we're doing at the moment um, that I've been doing in collaboration with Robbie Bickerton are faded worked examples, explicit assessment of separated concerns and reading comprehension. And we just can't, we can't mount a research project to develop each test. I mean, your, your slide 26 really made me laugh because I have to produce a problem sheet for students or I have to teach them something every week. It's no good me sitting here saying, oh, next year we might have developed this test. I mean, that's just not going to help me as a, as a practical maths teacher. From a research perspective, um, it's fascinating and it is the gold standard in test development, but we're just not going to do that every week. So we just, Robbie and I sat down and really tried to uh, develop some practical advice that teachers can use week by week. And this is what we've come up with. So what do we mean by faded worked examples? So here is a, uh, an example of an online assessment item that we developed to support proof by induction. Right, so you know, classic problem here, uh, let P of N be the statement, and the student has to prove this by induction. So they have to evaluate one squared, which is one, fine. They have to evaluate this expression, which is one, so P of one is true, right? So we have proved that the sum of the first square number is this, this formula, okay. And now the student has to fill in some more detail, right, uh, in the proof. So this is kind of a fill in the gaps proof. And this is what faded worked examples are all about. A faded, set of faded worked examples is a sequence of questions. Students are progressively asked to do more. And of course, the goal, the goal is, of course, their complete independence. But rather than being told to do three different proofs by induction and somehow muddling through, there is some design in what you're fading. So we give the students something that's quite highly structured, and then ultimately we would ask them to hand in a complete proof that they've written from, their, from themselves. And the idea of this sort of scaffolding is that there's less to worry about, right? The student can get used to what a proof by induction is, but they still have to engage in some level by filling in the gaps. And that's the idea behind faded work examples. So there's no suggestion that we can mark a complete proof online but at least the students can come to class prepared, right? They will have worked through a few examples before they come to class, before they hand in something to be marked by a human. Okay, the next idea is what we're calling separation of concerns. Now there's an awful lot going on in a typical proof, a huge amount. And um, Pablo's list here of seven things were really helpful in us to try and tease out things we might ask about a particular proof to separate out what's going on in the proof. There are the logical statements, the logical status of statements, the meaning of terms, justification of claims. These are the local and then the higher level uh, global concerns, summarizing high level ideas, identifying the modular structure, transferring the general ideas, illustrating the examples. So we've used these ideas, but we tried to turn them. Uh, so let me show you, show you the kind of things of, um, of how we've done this with induction again. So here is an induction proof. So rather than a faded worked example in this design, we are separating out the concerns. Right, so I'll just go through this. The goal is to prove this, uh, this again, an algebraic um, summation formula. So we've got a sum of something which gives an algebraic formula on the right hand side. So write out the statement P of N plus one. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating when we get students to do this in our first year introduction to Proust course, that a very high proportion of students think that P of N plus one is the right hand side of this equation. They're not operating on the whole equation. They're just operating on the right hand side. Secondly, if you can't write out the P N plus one, you've got nowhere to aim for in your algebraic derivation. You kind of wander around in a, in a kind of algebraic fog with no direction, right? Um, you know, you need to know where you're going. So you know where you, you know, when you've got there. <laughs> <laughs> so just writing out PM plus one is, is a kind of a useful thing for students to do. If you think question three is trivial, um, calculate this. Now this turns out, of course, to be 
a key part of the induction step. But actually, when we asked our first years to do this in January, February time, only 45% of our first year students could evaluate this correctly. Well, let's be honest about it. If you can't manipulate statements like that, which you need as part of an induction proof, there's very little hope of you ever coming up with uh, a correct induction proof. Like how, how on earth can you, can you prove this correctly if, you, if you, know, you just can't do this one step? So the idea of separating concerns is that the teacher designs some apparently trivial, but apparently not so trivial problems, so that when the student is asked to prove this by induction, they have done much of that, but separated out. Right? So that was the idea of separated out concerns. And so what Robbie and I developed are just practical lists of questions, and we're calling this the proof understanding baseline checklist. Right? And um, they're very specific questions that you might choose to ask about a particular proof. Now, of course, you're not going to ask every question every week because it just becomes massive and some of them are inappropriate and all the rest of it. So as a teacher, you have to decide which questions. But something you're almost always going to want to ask about is the formal definitions and the notation. Right? If students don't understand the notation, they're just stuck. Okay, so what formal definitions are relevant to the proof? Describe the overall structure of the proof. Okay, where is each hypothesis used in the proof? Um, are there examples which do and do not satisfy the hypothesis? Is there more than one hypothesis? Is a correct warrant justifying each step given in the proof? And if not, can we provide one? Okay, and all this kind of stuff. So Robbie and I, really very inspired by Pablo's previous work, have, have interpreted it in a very, well, what we hope is a much more practical way. So here's a proof that was uh, written by a colleague for this first year proofs and problem solving class. And it's kind of typical style, right? I mean, um, it's just sentences. It's kind of a mm, silly, is it a silly trivial result. Uh, if A plus B root 2 is C plus D root 2, then A is C and B is D. Right? So it's one of these kinds of fairly, mm, fairly elementary proofs. And the style that the, was chosen was a proof by contradiction. And we're contradicting that B is not D. Now that is not, right? That is not a contradiction to the conclusion of the proof. Because a contradiction to the conclusion of the proof is not B is not D. It would be B is not D or A is not C. So there's something fishy going on here. Um, and in order to write a proof comprehension sequence for this particular proof, actually, we had to rewrite the proof into just a slightly more structured form. So here, um, we have done some reasoning by equivalence to transform this statement into the form A minus C is equal to B minus D root 2. And then we're now doing two cases, if B is not D and if B is D. Okay. So we've just rewritten this proof just in a slightly, a slightly different way. And we can now see the explicit structure that there is some equivalence reasoning and then there's a proof by cases. And within that, one of the cases is a proof by contradiction and another case is a direct proof. So there is this kind of nested structure. And Pablo's already mentioned this idea of structured proofs. And I think, um, I think there's a lot of value in that if used judiciously. This is what I mean. I mean, this, this, just this example of rewriting a proof from a kind of very traditional form into just a slightly more structured form is what I mean about a sea change in how we write mathematics. I can see some hope for structured proofs like this being assessed automatically. I can't really see any hope for just this free form mass being assessed automatically or checked automatically. Just, just impossible. And in interpreting um, in trying to write, interpreting Pablo's work on, on proof comprehension tests and in trying to write our own proofs, we've had to develop a much more explicit vocabulary about proofs. Talking about proofs, we don't really have a good vocabulary. So one of the phrases that we've coined is this idea of a proof gadget. A proof gadget is a device within a proof built to establish that certain conditions hold. And Pablo already mentioned this absolutely famous proof. This, this is... Um, I think of this proof as a, an important cultural artifact in the subject and I would want our pure mathematicians to remember this proof when they when they graduate right it's so important 
the proof that there are infinitely many primes, you build this number. So this number n, which is the product of your finite number of primes plus one, this is the proof gadget. It's a device within the proof built to establish certain conditions must hold. And then you prove that n, um, you know, n is not prime and n must be divisible by one of the previous primes and that's your contradiction. So my conjecture is that if you can remember the definitions, which you should know, and if you can build the structure of the proof, it's a proof by contradiction. And if you know the kind of special gadget that makes the proof work, this should be enough to reconstruct the proof, right? At some meaningful level. I haven't done any research to test this conjecture, but you know, that's sort of how I operate if I want to remember proofs, is I don't remember, I don't just remember it line by line, which I think many students do, then many students just try and remember it. Um, I try and a part of understanding for me is just minimizing what you need to reconstruct it. On that checklist was a th was was one um, one thing about examples um, and um, which examples do and do not satisfy the hypothesis. If A is a bounded increasing sequence, then the limit exists. Well, this is kind of an interesting theorem because there are three three definitions in play: increasing, bounded, and convergent. So we would certainly want to test students' understanding of those three definitions but then there are eight possibilities right um, we've got an increasing sequence we've got a bounded sequence and we've got a, con a convergent sequence so an example of a sequence which satisfies that is a n is one minus one over n and that exemplifies the theorem now i know that you can't have an increasing bounded sequence which fails to converge because that would be a counterexample of the theorem but what I'm trying to suggest here is a systematic exploitation of examples. Right? These are all the possible combinations of hypotheses and conclusion. And there's no A here because this is kind of interesting. Boundedness is a necessary condition. So the two hypotheses in this theorem I do not have equal status, right? And I'm not sure students quite understand that. I mean, we can have examples which are um, not increasing and bounded and converge, right? But we can't have theorems which are where, where boundedness doesn't apply. So the systematic exploitation of examples is something that we could do to um, tease out students' understanding of proof, but it's not something we could, uh, I don't think we do this systematically. So the reading comprehension is asking students about a particular proof. Um, and <laughs> I think the experience that Robbie and I have had is that it turns out to be really quite hard to, to write these questions without ambiguity. Um, so although we set out to write things week by week and to avoid this research project approach to developing tests, actually it's really very tricky. Uh, and multiple choice questions, good multiple choice questions, as well as the kind of automatically assessed stack questions all have their place. I think writing these problems is something of an art form and having got into our stride, I think the thing, the kind of problem sheets that Robbie and I have been writing routinely are much better than our first attempts. Our first attempts really took a lot of effort and weren't that great uh, with hindsight, but I think what we're doing now and what we tried to write up in our paper on practical proof comprehension is much, much better. So I'm just going to show you briefly um, and it is, if we go to the proofs section, I have posted an example quiz uh, on the dot product in Cauchy Schwartz. Um, and I'm going to reattempt the quiz. So, this was designed for uh, our first year, first semester linear algebra course. And students will take this fairly early on in their first year of university. So, it's very, very elementary, right? I mean, completely my experience with asking students things. If it's trivial, students don't mind being asked it, but things we think are trivial are, are not trivial, right? So in the diagram above, two sides of the triangle are vectors, u and v, what vector represents the third side? So I know that's u minus v, right? I'm not sure that all our students will get that right, okay? And so this is just background to Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Can students remember from school trigonometry the cosine formula? Right. Here is a proof of the cosine formula, but we're proving it using vectors. So this will be new to the students and we want to get the students used to justifying statements 
and using these formal product formal uh, formal rules associated with the dot product so um, apply the cosine formula expand the left hand side so which rule is that that is u u dot is mod u squared u u dot is mod u squared that is rule five so you just type in rule five I just don't think this I just don't think this problem is going to turn out to be completely trivial for our students as trivial as it might look to us as professionals. But this providing a warrant for steps in the proof where it comes from a kind of formal set of rules for the dot product is I think kind of part of that mix. Um, now onto the Cauchy. So this is the first few questions. The first page of questions was before you get to the theorem that you're interested in. Then there is illustrating with examples the theorem that we that we are interested in. We're interested in the cauchy schwartz inequality. I, I, I would be surprised if uh, students really think about what this means. And in any case, in, in week one and two, getting them to do a little bit more practice with calculating a dot product, calculating the norms of vectors is no bad thing. So just what is this actually saying? Okay, well, here's an example. And then there is a theorem um, for all vectors u. So you type in what this is going to be algebraic expressions u1 times v1 time oh, so it'll be um, squared won't it so that first term will be squared right? etc so the student has to fill in the gaps in this proof then there's a questions about particular terms that we use as professionals when does equality hold so that's a that's a term we want them to start learning these terms about equality holds and then there's a separate proof about using projections. So we're going to talk about projections, which students would have just learned about. So calculate the projection. And now there is a proof using projections. And then last in this sequence of problems, um, in the previous questions, there are two approaches to the proof of the cauchy schwartz inequality. Well, it's kind of interesting. We might provide two different proofs. There's something in that. One approach is algebraic and involves manipulation of components of the vectors. The other gives a geometric approach using projections. Which proof do you prefer and why? So now this is not an automatically assessed question. It never will be. Um, but the whole point is that this proof, that this proof in which line relies on the fact that we're in R2, well, none. Right? Nowhere in the proof do we use the fact that this is in R2. Yep. So that's kind of interesting. So this proof will immediately generalize to Rn with, without any effort, whereas the previous proof won't. So that's what Robbie and I have been up to, this kind of, uh, kind of um, approach to proof comprehension and assessment of proof. And I have to say, it would just be much easier to get the students to say prove this than it is to write these kinds of questions about a proof. And I am over time, George, I apologise, but just to conclude, um, we're increasingly asking about proof and reasoning, not just asking students to prove something. And I think actually we might better serve our students that way. The more I do this, the more I think about crafting these sequences of problems, I think encounters with proof um, will better serve our students. And I completely agree with Pablo's final comment on sensitization here. If we start doing this routinely with students, then I hope that that will rub off and that we will sensitize students to that kind of thing and that they will start doing that for themselves. Um, it turns out to be quite hard to write these questions without ambiguity. I think that was really a big surprise. Another big surprise was that questions that were apparently trivial to me are often surprisingly hard for the students. So that was interesting. Well, assessment of free form proof is some way off, but I think this kind of online assessment, uh, online submission and human marking is definitely going to have a place. And I think that's going to have an increasing place. We're looking at various tools to support the workflow for marking, to give, um, to reuse feedback that apply to many students' work. So you don't have to write the same thing on the work every time. So I think a combination of automatic assessment and electronic submission is, um, is what we're going to be doing over the next few years. Okay, so I have overrun there. Apologies. Um, yeah, and um, I guess I'll take questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, there were a couple of questions. I think because we're short on time, we'll maybe just hope you're okay to answer those on the discussion forum. Um, Certainly, yeah. And, well, yeah, thank you. So hopefully the um, the fact that you've shared that example, um, everyone has access to that in the, the course. Um, people will be interested to, to go off and have a look at that afterwards as well. Um, and the paper with, with Robbie, um, where you set out um, 
some more ideas about how you might structure these tests. Okay. Thanks very much. And we'll head over to Siri for the, the final input from Warwick, where you've been doing, I gather, a sort of similar problem of yep. how to assess students online now. Okay. Am I in full screen now? Yep. <clears throat> okay. Um, right. Um, thank you for um, the invitation. Um, I promise I'll try to finish on time. Okay. So um, this is um, some work that I've done over the past few months um, about um, online assessments um, in analysis at Warwick. So a little bit of background, um, I'm at the Maths Institute. I joined Warwick a year ago and um, analysis was one of the modules that I've been assigned to teach. This is the first year module. Um, and uh, here are some motivations of why um, I started doing online assessments, okay? So before all this COVID stuff, um, we were already thinking if we could do some online quizzes and whether things like Stack could work for pure courses. Now Warwick is quite a, a heavily pure course compared to um, other maths degrees that I know of. So um, as far as I know, um, online quizzes and stack, it, it wasn't a thing before. It's always been, you know, traditional um, hand in and it's pretty much um, blackboard based um, throughout your whole degree. So I thought, how can we spice things up a little bit? Okay. And um, another thing was that students in the first year um, have been complaining um, that they have too many um, deadlines, especially, especially in the second um, term, which I teach analysis. They have um, you know, three, four, five deadlines a week, which was not good. Um, finally, to mitigate uncertainties in marking and teaching provision um, caused by COVID-19, of course, um, your un universities may be thinking um, along the same line. You don't know how often you can meet. You don't know how many people can meet. You don't know how many people are going to be there to mark the work. So um, we had to come up with some kind of quick solutions. Okay, so um, my course in particular is um, Analysis 2 which is the second course in real analysis. They do this in the second term of year one. It's, uh, it starts in January, it runs for 10 weeks. It's a core module for mathematicians. We have 350 students in the first year last year, but this year we're probably going up a little bit. Um, about analysis one in the first term, um, they study number sequences and series basically. And when it comes to analysis two, my first lecture starts with epsilon delta continuity and um, goes on to differentiation. And my last lecture is about uh, radius of convergence and limb sup and limb min and things like that. Okay. We don't quite cover integration um, in the first year. I, I don't know why, not formally anyway, um, but that's just how things work here. Um, another thing I should mention is that Warwick uses Moodle, so uh, a lot of my talk in the practical application side of things is going to be based around Moodle, but um, I guess the ideas that I'll be talking about, you can um, apply this to uh, whatever um, IVL your university has. This is uh, my um, the web page of my analysis to course. So just you can see that uh, I've got um, 10 weeks here of material continuity and um, point wise, and you go on to um, interval continuity, intermediate value theorem kind of thing. Um, you've got epsilon delta definition of limits. You've got inverse function theorem, the simplest kind, introduction to differentiation as a limit. And I don't know what this is, I can't remember. Um, mean value theorem, L'Hopital through, um, which has some massive proofs. And um, we've got Taylor's theorem, and radius of convergence, series differentiation, limb sub, limb of Cauchy, other math theorem, that kind of thing. Okay, so quite a lot of material actually. And this was how it was before, well, this is how it was, how it is this year. Uh, we've got uh, 10 problem sheets. Um, and most of which uh, are to be handed in. And 
um, that's that's a lot of a lot of work because on top of yourself they've got other modules to think about so um, you know electronic marking electronic assignments I didn't think it was going to completely uh, replace um, the the things that you could learn by doing of course traditional proof with pen and paper and coming up with your own proofs okay rather than filling in the blanks and um, doing all sorts of things that I'll show you later um, so what I want to do this year is to um, turn that into um, 10 online quizzes instead and every other week you do a traditional um, hand in of sheet one, sheet two, sheet three, sheet four here, and probably optional sheet five because by the time um, you know you want to finish the term and it's probably too late to have it formally assessed. And my uh, my goal is that everyone who passes these um, tests, let's say eight out of these ten quizzes, get flat five percent. You can do them as many times as you like, as long as you do them by a certain deadline. You pass them and that you get 5% and 10% will be reserved for the, the, the handwritten work. So only all in all is 15 minutes, of, sorry, 15% of assignments, which um, works out to be the same as, um, as, as that previous method. Okay, so um, what did I do? Well, um, first of all, my background is not in stack at all. I have used online assessments before that they were in maple ta slash mobius and as a newcomer is uh, probably more challenging to convince the department to pay for something which nobody has ever used before um, so uh, stack is free i thought oh i'll give it a go and just see how it works out and it's worked out really well I haven't written stack uh, questions before until a few months ago so I attended some of the uh, workshops that uh, Chris and George organized and stole lots of ideas of them. I recruited a summer intern, um, Kate Harrison, who has helped me over four weeks and so far we have created um, 42 multi-part questions. I'll show you some of these and um, we were both kind of uh, new to these things so um, it's, it's, it's a miracle we got everything done, okay? <laughs> so, um, by the way, the test, um, if the Lumini attempts, each attempt is going to build on the last so that your correct answers, well, all your answers are preserved and you just need to go in and do it again and correct whatever you got wrong. And the passing mark, I've set it to be around 80%. Uh, tested it on students, seems to be okay. It seems a bit high, but considering that you've got infinitely many attempts, and also the fact that um, you can discuss these things with your supervisors and your friends. So it's, it's reasonable, I think. Okay. Um, uh, Kate and I sent George about 3 million emails asking lots of technical questions. And we're very grateful that he always uh, replies very quickly, even though he was going on holidays and so on. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll show you some um, examples and some of the different techniques that we use to, to tackle uh, proofs in um, our analysis course now, okay? So this is a, uh, I think is a week zero assignment where you are asked to recall a theorem, um, the Archimedean property um, from analysis one. And I do need this in analysis two, so I want to make sure that students know this statement and um, probably understand the proof um, of it. And um, the, these arrows thingy, they are just drop down um, menu where you choose from the axis um, for all and so on. And um, choose from max, uh, supremum or infimum. Okay, so these are all kind of drop down menu. The last statement asks you which step uses completeness property. And this is um, the idea that I stole from going to a talk by uh, Robbie and Chris. So just asking you uh, which step, which we, we broke up the proof into step and just ask uh, which step you needed that particular uh, gadget. Okay, so that's fairly uh, straightforward. Um, and Here's um, something quite entertaining, which you might want to use for your own students. You know, you've recommended a book. Nobody ever reads it. Actually, nobody ever touched that book that you recommended. Okay, so 
this is um, a question that says, uh, books are helpful. This is in week zero. Books can often give you a different perspective on a topic from what your lecturer presents in class. This question is my attempt to make you at least take a quick look at the book I recommended for this module. My hope is you'll keep browsing and come back to them again in the coming weeks. Okay. Anyway, I, you know what I'm trying to do um, is I try to put a little bit of myself in these quizzes so they don't sound so dry. They don't sound like, oh, they could have got this quiz from anywhere. They, they feel like oh, you're in this quiz from me, the lecturer at Warwick University. Okay. So for example, in this question, in the main textbook, written by Barton and Sherbert. I don't tell you what the book is called. Um, you have to go and look it up. The work of which famous mathematician is discussed in detail on page, something that is going to be randomized for every student, thanks to uh, Stack. And um, but, uh, Leibniz is the answer here. And um, same for another book, which we found useful by uh, Lara Alcock. And, uh, and again, this, this gets randomized to 116. And my parting remarks here is that you may or may not get along with these books, which is okay because everyone likes different books and different styles of writing and explanation. But I really hope that you do find a book that you like, not just for analysis, but for every module. Okay, so uh, just um, put it out there. Another uh, two that I stole of uh, George's talk is the JSX graph. You can see I stole a lot of ideas from going to these workshops. So this is... Um, uh, visual um, explanation or visualization of the epsilon delta um, definition. And, you know, whilst writing um, this question, um, I, it just occurred to me that if only somebody showed me this app thing, when I was studying, I would have understood the, uh, the epsilon delta concept much faster. And so what it is, is the JSX graph has the ability for you to um, in this case, um, choose the value of epsilon that you like. This is a slider. You can slide um, just to increase or decrease the value of epsilon up to one. And you can also move this point C on the x-axis here to talk about point-wise continuity. Which point are you interested in? So you can uh, shift along. And um, the graph itself, if you're uh, concerned about students getting the same answer for the delta, which is going to be adjusted automatically, um, you can randomize this graph as well. You can just throw in some multiplicative constant, which is randomized or whatever. So um, stack is useful in that case. You can also see there's some buttons here, which is zooming in and out and um, shifting the display window left and right. It's really, really good. Okay, so th the explanation is here, adjust epsilon and F adjust the point C, which you are talking about. Um, the slider has some tolerance, some students will not um, see the same answer depending on the, the browser and the, the size of the window. Okay, that will see different numbers and sometimes you can't get it exactly to land onto the, the, the number that you want. So I, I gave some warning there. Okay, so this, what sort of numbers is going to make this work, this epsilon delta work, given that epsilon is 0.3. So your job is to change this to 0.3 and then move the um, C to the value one. Yeah, looking at this and the answer you can see is automatically given here 0.13 or something. And the answer to two decimal places is there. So it's nice and a lot of uh, randomization can go into this. Um, by the way, um, you know, Kate and I weren't um, clever enough to come up with our own um, code for writing uh, for creating this JSX graph. Um, there's a JSX graph wiki, which is very useful. And you can take some examples there and modify it as you like, which is what we did here. We took some of the examples and we modified it to display uh, more decimal places and change the graph and change some letters. So it's really helpful. You don't need to learn JavaScript from scratch to, to, um, to, to do these things, okay? Here's another uh, question, this time with an actual proof. Um, here's uh, some statement in a box here. F is different. Here's a function which is strange, which has a strange property such that F is differentiable at a point and F prime is positive at that point. Yet there exists no neighborhood of C in which F is strictly increasing. And it sounds very counterintuitive. F prime is positive. I thought that meant increasing. So uh, here is an example which is not doing that. And 
this is a JSX graph question which you can zoom in and out. Then the perfect thing about this JSX graph is that you can zoom in and the point is that the more you zoom in, the more you see this picture. It's going to keep on oscillating no matter how much you zoom in. So it's a perfect tool to study this um, example. Okay, so the first part asks you kind of, uh, oh, what's the equation of these bounding curves? Um, write down the equation of the red curve and the green curve. The next part is the proof that um, there is no, um, there is no, um, no neighborhood in which f is increasing. So the first bit is uh, asking you to show that actually, yes, f prime of zero is positive. Um, I find that this part, we needed some of uh, Chris's and Robbie's um, kind of syntax hint just to scaffold them a little bit as to uh, what, what is expected. If you leave this completely blank, I assure you can, you get a thousand and one answers here. You just want to know that when you want students to substitute in this function, and then you see there's an x below, you should cancel away this x and that x, and um, that's the answer over here. And the next one, I want a number when the limit goes away. And um, that number, you may not think, uh, you may not be able to get it right away, but reading on it says that we use the fact that this thing is bounded, the sign just oscillates up and down. So when x goes to zero, both sides are going to go to zero and apply something theorem. And so altogether it tells me, okay, we're gonna ignore this horrible part and just put it at that, that first question mark, whatever that number is. And this blank here, um, we accept uh, um, squeeze and sandwich or you know, those kind of things. Okay. So that's, that's a nice um, kind of little scaffolding proof. Um, here's something which is not a uh, stack, but is part of Mojo. And we, what we did was we just kind of use it in combination with stack, where we have a two part question. The question is prove this chain rule Proof the chain rule is not easy. And in our course, we do this using um, Carroll Theodore's theorem. Um, anyway, that doesn't matter what it is. It's just quite a long proof. And um, the, this is, um, I guess, the idea of the proof, right? So there's something that uh, Juan Pablo was talking about. What is the big picture here? And um, I just want the students here to drag these objects, these letters into the right place, right? You've got a combination, like a composition of functions. Where is F supposed to go? Where is G supposed to go? So that it summarizes what you're trying to prove. Where is D? Where is C? Which domain is J? Which domain is I? Is this long arrow F circle G or G circle F? That put one of them is a fake answer. Okay, so that's, that's a nice thing that um, Mojo already has. And the next bit, the proof, is a stack thing. And um, it's on the same page as that diagram. So you can always go, go and refer to the diagram and then uh, try to fill in these correct answers. You can see the, the, the blanks that are filled in, they're not uh, completely easy. And there's some syntax um, thing here. And um, uh, stack is um, uh, it's still uh, trying to uh, come to terms with um, the subscripts and it's something that I've, uh, I've asked uh, Chris and George about. But anyway, it, that's a technical thing. The thing is um, that fill in the blanks here. And again, at the end of the proof, you want to go back and ask which step is a consequence of current theory theorem. And there's some uh, drop downs here, which step uses algebra of continuous function. Again, it's nice to break it up into uh, different numbers. Okay. And I think this is uh, my last example that I'm going to show you. Um, one of the uh, types of problems that uh, Mojo has is called the ordering type. And I thought, I, I don't want to give always the same kind of fill in the blanks and drop down, maybe it gets quite dry after a while. So uh, here I've got the ordering type where I want students to, uh, I've, I've given the Lego pieces here, you just need to build me uh, a car or a spaceship or whatever, okay? Place the following statements in the correct order to prove that for all rational numbers, um, the function e, and this is second part of some num some question which explain what e is, essentially it's the exponential function, but um, it it has some two properties of E, which you use exclusively to build up the property and 
um, show that e to the r is e to the r, right? e is a constant, okay? So in tackling this, it looks very difficult at the moment, actually, but um, there will be a similar, uh, kind of not, not totally similar proof, but um, the, the idea is the same as this proof in the lecture, which says that if you need some results for rational numbers, why don't you prove it for integers first, okay? So I'm going to go down and look at all these things and go, mm, which one is going to deal with integers? Those are probably the first ones to go. So I'm, I think I'm thinking the fifth one is uh, kind of integer -y. So this must be uh, towards the top, whereas things like negative rational here, like this third one from the bottom, that is probably going to go towards the bottom, isn't it? Um, this thing below one over integer, that's probably going to be a little bit more on top, but below the integer thing. So keep on doing this. And after a while, you come up with the space sheet. Okay, so that's, that's the idea for this one. That's quite fun. That's a few of these problems. What did we do after the test? Uh, we uh, got to make sure that every question is tested by at least one student who is not your intern, you do need fresh pairs of eyes. Ask your students to try to push it to the limit, um, try to break it, and um, tell you about it in person, well, on, online, but talk about it. Um, not just, you know, it's not enough to just send you a written set of notes or write uh, or you just checking the, the online um, the results. You really need to talk talk about um, what, what happened and what went well, what did go well, okay. So this is my last slide, the conclusions and some tips um, that I can give to others who are trying to think about doing this. And they may be thinking, oh, is it too late? I haven't, um, haven't thought about this earlier. I don't think it's too late because it's possible to turn proofs in your existing assignments and notes into online assignments. It's never going to replace the experience of actually constructing a proof, writing it down, piece of paper and submitting in and getting feedback, that kind of thing. But I think this complements um, the traditional method and it's good uh, given what we are experiencing, right? Okay. So um, I would say try mixing stack with other types of questions that are already available on your VLE. Students can help you create and test questions. It benefits everyone, the helpers, um, are going to benefit from learning the material. And you know, Kate has another line in her CV that says she was she did this internship over the summer, um, helping me for a month, and so on. And um, you get what you want. And it's a student's um, view of the problem. So it's really good. And testing with fresh pairs of eyes is really essential. Never, never release a problem until a student has looked at it, OK? Speaking from experience. And um, lastly, start your work early. Um, it's not going to be easy, especially the first time is the hardest, but we're reaping long-term reward here. So be patient, it will pay off in the end. Okay, that's it. All right, thank you, Siri. Um, that looks like an enormous amount of work. That's kind of my um, comment. I don't know if that's more of a question. So could you quantify maybe how much work it was? It's really interesting. <laughs> Um, so to create those 42 questions, it was um, working with Kate. So we meet every working day online. Uh, we talked about it. Uh, we talked about what, what's, what's the goal of the day. So and at the end of the day, we're like, oh, okay, this is still not done. Let's ask George about it and come back <laughs> to it tomorrow. Um, so that went on for, for a month, just the creation. And then the testing itself, I would say, everyone's got different deadlines. So give it another month for the testing. Yeah. Mm. But I guess your goal was relatively ambitious, having a quiz each week, and some of the things look quite um, advanced and complicated. It is, yeah. yeah it is, so maybe yeah. if people are thinking, oh, I've got this class to do quite soon, there are some things that they could do. Um, I think so. I mean, not, um, not every, you don't really need to reinvent the wheels. Everyone's already got questions that you want to, uh, you want to ask. And the hardest ones are the first ones you create. After that, you just kind of copy and paste the code and it's, it doesn't take that long after that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay, th thank you again to all the speakers. It was really interesting. Um, I'll stop the recording at this point and we can carry on. Um, I guess 
unlike in our physical situation, we've not got a kind of class waiting outside to get in. So we can just hang on and have a chat if, if you're able to stay around. And we can just have a sort of informal chat with the presenters if they're still able to be with us. Um, but thank you all again. All right. Let me unshare my screen.